A year ago, I started a world-building project centered around these original handmade models. Each build tells its own story, while gradually peeling back another layer of Aegis, the planet these stories occur on. Today we're traveling upwards, from the deserts of Arami to the space above its atmosphere, where a network of satellites, orbital stations, and cruisers are managed by the satellite. I'll design, then build, then paint and assemble this Automeca bust with the designation Unit 992. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. The idea for this build had been rattling around in my head for some time. While I really enjoy doing miniatures and scale dioramas, it was a welcome change to scale up, way up, and try my hand at a kit-bashed Automeca bust. This toy laser gun from a thrift store served as the core of this build, which necessitated removing the price tag, then giving it a thorough cleaning with this rubbing alcohol. Inside the electric toy, I was pleased to unearth tons of useful innards, like circuit boards, wiring, LEDs, speakers, hinges, and lenses. While I tend to get pretty reckless with disassembly, I've learned to slow down a bit here, as a lot of these components were recyclable. I've also had this old laptop CD-ROM drive for ages, so I thought it was time to dissect it for parts, and I'm glad I did. Finally, I thought the remnants of this Nerf gun that I've hacked up for previous builds would come in handy for this one. After finding the most interesting orientation for the head, I began sketching out exactly what I saw using a three-point perspective angle to allow for a better understanding of the form. By the way, with this build I've made the switch to 0.3 and 0.5 mechanical pencils, which are responsible for the clean and crispy lines you see here. Because the scale here was so much larger than my previous mechas, I spent a lot of time thinking about the practical design and engineering, like this double ball and bracket design for the neck. Not only would this lead to a more functional appearance, it also allow for some limited articulation and posing. Ah, fresh air. I don't leave my workspace too often, but it was such a nice day that I thought I'd visit a local lake and do my line work and watercolors there. As always, I'm using a Tombow brush pen for the thicker outlines, the link for which you can find in the video description below. While my body thanked me for finally allowing it some much needed vitamin D, it was actually a pretty windy and cold day at the lake, and my camera batteries all died on me, so it was back to the bat cave for the watercolors. I went with this teal aqua blue for most of the bust, as I thought it suggested royalty, which fits this particular mecha's backstory. Speaking of stories, the Beyond the Blight novel I announced in the last video is well underway. Of course, because I'm only writing it on the side, as I continue to focus mostly on these builds and videos, it'll be months before it's ready to release, but it's been a thrill delving into the format of a full-length book with a single cast of characters. There are also plenty of interesting tie-ins to the short stories from the videos, and I'll reveal more as I progress with its writing. And with the concept work finally done, it was time to figure out how to build this thing. One of the more unwieldy parts of any kit bashing project is cutting and shaping thick plastic bits like these. I was able to cut the straight part with a miter saw, but quickly moved on to this brand new handheld rotary tool from Hardell. You can get the kit I'm using here for about $25 on Amazon. It was a really nice alternative to the Dremel I've used for years, and not having to fight with a cord was great, though it's worth noting that since this is operated by a chargeable battery, it doesn't quite pack the same punch, which caused the blade to occasionally stop when the resistance was too high. I'd still take this over a corded tool any day, however, as I loved being able to set it down anywhere or throw it in a drawer when not in use. As a tip, when cutting plastic or wood like this, it's always good to cut a millimeter or so outside of the intended shape, so that you can come back later and sand it down for a smoother, more precise result. I did this starting with the Hardell tool and a fine sanding bit, 
then progressed to a nail file. This interactive LCD screen is called a space pod. While it's intended as a desktop accessory to display the time, stock prices, and animations, when Nextus Industry reached out to me about trying their product, I was frank that I would only do it if I could tear the thing apart and use it in one of my builds. This conversation was happening while I was still working on the concept art, which is why it wasn't included in the painting I did, but I was really excited at the potential for a programmable screen. Satisfied that the thing still worked even after evisceration, I cut out a rectangle of cardstock to match the screen's dimensions and used it to cut a window into the side of the mecha's head. Again, I'm cutting just slightly away from the markings here to ensure that I get a clean, straight edge, and after plenty of vigorous filing, I had my window. I then quickly built a frame with some 2mm styrene plastic. I also had to do a bit of brute force modification to the AA battery pack, which would sit just behind the screen to give the space pod enough room for the USB outlet. I've joked before about being a horrible electrician, and sadly I haven't really improved much in the months I've been building these dioramas. So this is why I usually stay away from switches and lights and batteries, but I decided to force myself to improve with this build. After all, this laser gun did come with a AA battery pack, making it more than capable of powering everything I wanted to include. So after doing some research right here on YouTube on voltage and resistors, I came up with my own wiring diagram that I thought would work to power both a red LED for the eye and the LED screen. I was pretty confident that I'd gotten everything right, but sadly the spliced USB charging cable simply wouldn't cooperate, even after double checking the voltage and the manufacturer's specs. So I opted to simplify the circuit, adding just a single switch for the back of the head and a red LED for the eye. This worked like a charm, so I decided to simply hook up the LCD screen to a hidden external power bank. For the screen display, I wanted a looping animation similar to this one I did for a previous build. Unfortunately for me though, while this animation was super cool, the screen stopped working shortly after this, so I was forced to use a backup screen I was sent that could only display still images. After roughing up the head halves to make it easier to attach things to, I began modifying this Nerf gun. I wanted a secondary piece that would hide the battery door while also making the laser gun a little bit less recognizable. One fun thing about making a bust in such a large scale was that I could add real hardware like these screws. After hiding the toy seams with super glue and baking soda and a bit of sanding, I made some tiny additions using 1mm styrene. A hole was then added for a switch to activate the LED. This brushless DC electric motor, which I scavenged from an old laptop, worked really well as one of the mechanisms inside the mecha's head, but I needed a second one for the other side, so I picked up this old CD-ROM drive from a thrift store for less than $2. Unfortunately though, it wasn't a close enough match, and this is where 3D design and printing come in really handy. While I could have gallivanted all over town or combed through Craigslist to find the same laptop drive, being able to quickly and cost-effectively produce this replica was a no-brainer. After staring at the ear-like antenna part of my concept art for the better part of a week, I decided to make some changes, cutting out some variations from an old cereal box to see which shapes I liked best. Satisfied with this shape here, I cut the design out of 2mm styrene sanded the edges, then doubled up the material for added thickness. For detailing, I printed out some templates, cut them from 1mm styrene, snapped all the pieces out, and glued. As with the head, screws and wires were added for cosmetic effect. Next, a few other details were added to the head, like these plastic bits from a CD tray of the same laptop from before. These greeblies from an old toy helicopter were then added, along with this 2mm aluminum wire to simulate some electrical wiring. Finally, I drilled a bunch of holes all over the head so that I could come back later and add screws. I then began working on the mech's visor, the bulk of which came from a Nerf gun. 
This is the third time I've used pieces from this particular Nerf toy, and I think it's kind of neat using parts from a single item in different builds as it ties the models together at a physical level, meaning the builds are linked beyond just the fiction. One of the trickier parts of this particular build was making sure the two halves would fit together seamlessly, with all gaps filled properly before painting. By the way, these are broken brake lights I recently replaced on my car. And this is a tiny necklace pendant, which I posed, then super glued, then glued to the visor as a royal ornament. Once the building stage had finished, I went back and roughed everything up. The idea here is that the scrapes and scratches would hold onto the dark primer paint coat, helping to really sell the look of heavily worn metal. And finally, some tiny magnets were added so that the visor would fit snugly and stay in place. The neck was a real pain in itself, as I wanted something that matched the concept art but also made sense functionally. I started with this plastic thing, adding some tiny beads for ball joints. Then the 6mm acrylic tube was used for the carotid artery-like neck pistons, and to make them fit a bit more snugly with the ball joints, I widened the inner diameter with this conical sanding bit on my new Hardell rotary tool. It was then onto pilfering my Gundam scraps for the collar end ball joints. By the way, I get all of my Gundam pieces from eBay, where I can usually get big bags of assorted scraps for $15 to $20 US. Once everything was dry fitted together, I locked it in place with a bit of Gorilla Glue. I explored a lot of options for the shoulders, but it turned out that this tiny space pod decorative case for the LED screen worked perfectly when flipped upside down. First though, I had to manufacture this piece from the concept art, a double ball joint for the neck. This was designed in Adobe Animate, then cut out of 2mm basswood on my new laser cutter. Of course, I know that not everyone has access to a laser cutter, but these pieces could have also been cut by hand out of styrene. Once the laser cut sides were glued together, these plastic balls from who knows where became the ball joints. I glued the connectors then added this toy bolt, and the neck components were all glued together. I then drilled a hole into the other ball joint, and the other half of the toy bolt was added to give a way to attach the neck to the head. These are called spalders, pieces of armor worn to protect the shoulders, and seen commonly on knight's armor from the 15th century. The bases of the spalders were designed digitally, then cut out of 2mm chipboard, also known as greyboard. Then finer details were cut from 1mm chipboard. I opted for this material over wood for the flexibility as I needed them to be curved, but also for their texture, which I hoped would have a coarser, leathery look. Once assembled, I coated in Mod Podge to firm the pieces up and allow for painting. With the building stage done, it was time for painting and assembly. And as always, that means our short story. When Security Unit 992 activated, it found itself floating in a cold, vacant corridor bits of frayed wire and charred metal swirling in the air around it. Something was horribly wrong. Sparks sputtered from conduits, splashing the disarrayed space in spasmodic light. As dictated by protocol, the security unit immediately queried the ship's AI, but the response was puzzling. There had been security incidents reported on two of the ship's three decks, with seven confirmed casualties. All surveillance systems had been deactivated using an override code, locking out the AI. Apart from the initial emergency reports, the system was in the dark. An intruder was on board. Unit 992 performed a visual scan of the corridor, where it found fragments of human tissue. It activated its rear propulsion jets, thrusting it deeper into the craft. 
its head-mounted light stabbed at the murky darkness, but there was little more to be discovered. The unit attempted opening a comms channel with the captain, but there was no response. The situation was critical. From around the corner, the security unit heard something. A groaning, metallic scraping. Readying its weapon, it flicked off its light and killed the propulsion system. Silently, it drifted deeper into the blackness, closer to the sound. I can't get any leverage, a voice hissed from the other side of the door. It had been negotiated open by a half centimeter, allowing a blade of white light to penetrate. Security Unit 992 listened carefully, struggling to process the voice signature. It had access to the ship's database, and with it, the biometrics of every crew member. But this was an unknown voice, an intruder. If he's in there, aim straight for the head, full power came the voice again. It heaved through gritted teeth, and the door groaned open another few centimeters. Full power could damage the ship's systems, came a second voice, a woman. I don't care. Do what you have to, Lieutenant, the man grunted. A superior and a lieutenant. A sanctioned attack, likely from a rival royal house. An act of war. Security Unit 992 lifted its weapon and waited, its momentum pulling it closer and closer to the doorway. It did not reach out to slow itself or make any other movements that would attract attention. It was a mechanical ghost drifting in a void. With the subtlest of motions, the security unit dialed down the power on its blaster rifle. The intruders would be subdued arrested, and hauled off for interrogation. The unit wondered where they had come from, how they had snuck aboard, and how many they had killed and injured. The door lurched open with a metallic shriek, and Security Unit 992 instantly fired two shots at the intruders' chests, their center of mass. But the bolts were much too bright, much too powerful for the low setting. Unit 992 stared dumbly at the weapon in its hands. The readout screen jittered wildly, digits and symbols mixed with static and jumbled feedback. The two bodies tumbled and twisted backwards through the air, and the unit propelled itself forward to intercept them. It secured them to the corridor walls with a length of frayed webbing, and it stared deeply into their faces where expressions of shock were forever etched. The faces were unfamiliar, as were the names embroidered on the lapels. Yet, they wore the clothes of the ship's crew. Unit 992 did not understand, and so it pressed deeper into the derelict ship. The carrier lurched now, a grumbling sound from deep within vibrating up through the hull. Unit 992 reached out a hand to steady itself, and when it touched the hull, a powerful surge ripped through its frame, racing over its circuits and chipsets, clearing its memory banks and corrupting its data. And when Security Unit 992 activated, it found itself floating in a cold, vacant corridor, bits of frayed wire and charred metal swirling in the air around it. Something was horribly wrong, and then it heard something. Open your eyes, what can you see around? Wind of the open sky over the siren sound This is a dream Getting the royal scar Holding a diamond blade Throwing it far 
thank you all so much for watching. If you'd like to help support this channel, consider joining my Patreon for access to behind the scenes photos, downloads, and even coupons for my merch. To check out that merch, head over to gamybuilds.com. Until next time, this is Gamey Builds, over and out.